relevance of the contribution of uh, Francesca Esposito, who is uh, the speaker for this webinar, has been uh, formally uh, recognized as uh, she is uh, the winner of two dissertation, not one, two dissertation awards, one that was awarded by a CPA and the other one that was awarded by SCRA. And um, the topic of her dissertation is uh, uh, immigration detention. And the title for the webinar for today is, as you all know, examining and challenging immigration detention, what role for community uh, psychology. I'm not going to, to spend uh, too much time uh, in presenting Francesca uh, Esposito, who received uh, her PhD in community psychology in 2019, and uh, who uh, from, from there has started a brilliant career. She is uh, now at when, uh, the University of Westminster in uh, London, and she is also a research associate uh, at the Center of Criminology in Oxford. And uh, we are really, we are really um, willing and eager to listen to her contribution for today. Uh, we are honored because uh, uh, together uh, with uh, Francesca, uh, we will have the contribution of Regina Langhout. Uh, she is a, a well-known scholar across the globe for having worked in particular with the uh, marginalized community and uh, adopting uh, um, paradigm of participatory action research. And uh, we thought that uh, uh, having the chance to engage uh, those two um, brilliant scholars into conversation would really provide the interesting input for the community psychologist community. And I want to um, also uh, let um, give the, the floor for a minute to Susan Wolf, who together with me was uh, very happy to promote this event. And now, well, when, when we thought about this event, she was the president of SCRA. Now she's not, but this happened very, I would say, a few days ago. But still, she's uh, with us and uh, she's uh, happy to uh support this initiative so i want to give her the floor for her welcoming hi everybody i'll just say welcome and um thanks for coming and it's good to see you all here okay thank you susan and thank you for the support that we had for from us crying promoting the event so um, I think that uh, we can start. I'm really happy to leave the floor to Francesca. Um, the idea for the, the afternoon is the following. Uh, Francesca will, uh, will start. And uh, basically, we, uh, Regina Langert will uh, uh, make some comments and some questions uh, at the end of Francesca's presentation, but she will also engage into conversation with the, with the public, with the audience. I invite you, uh, if you have questions, to write them uh, uh, in the chat, or if you want to make comment, to uh, write it in the chat and uh, Afterwards, I will give uh, the floor to each of you. I think that as we are not uh, uh, so many, uh, everyone will have the chance if you want to uh, open the microphone and make uh, questions and comments at the end. So Francesca, now it's uh, your turn. Thank you again for 
having accepted our invitation and thank you for to all the audience for being here. Thank you, Cinzia, and uh, I hope you can hear me well. And uh, yeah, hi everyone. I want to really thank Cinzia for this very generous introduction. <laughs> you almost made me embarrassed <laughs> for, for your compliments. And yeah, thank you so much. And also Susan for being here and also for have been so supportive for this uh, webinar. So thank you. And of course, thank also Gina uh, for I mean, accepting this invitation. It's an honor for me to be in conversation with her because she's a really a great scholar who has been working a lot on this. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's going to be really a pleasure and an honor. And uh, also, I I'm very happy. I want to, to say hello and thank all the people who are here. Um, the majority are uh, friends, colleagues. There is my supervisor, who I deserve a special thank, Professor Jose Ornelas, who is directly connected from his classroom with the students. And thank you so much for participating. And uh, 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 he knows that all my work has been deeply inspired by his work on the institutionalization and uh, in the area of mental health uh, and he has been working there for in portugal for decades on this and so i i uh, owe him a lot <laughs> so thank you and uh, of course erica and also new friends who we are working together in community psychology to to challenge migration injustice bread Juano is here, Moshud, Aminata, Megan, and uh, there is Donata, who has been my first professor of community psychology. And uh, yeah, she has been the first one inspiring me to start working with, in this discipline. So I also uh, owe her a lot. Um, Giacomo and Emilio, who are also working with me and are activists engaged in Italy on detention. So uh, it's really, uh, there is Alex from Forum Refugio, who's also working in the field in Portugal with people seeking, asyl seeking asylum. So it's a, a great group of people engaged on these issues, and it's an honor to be discussing this with, with all of you. And also my new colleague, Emma, who has been so kind to, to join our workshop, even if she's not a community psychologist. And yeah, so happy to have her too. So I'm going to start my presentation. As you know, my work has been on immigration detention, so I decided to entitle it Examining and Challenging Immigration Detention, What Role for Community Psychology. Um, so very briefly, an introduction, because uh, I mean, the majority of you already know this and even have direct experience of this. But in the past decades, uh, I think we have all witnessed an increasing securitization and criminalization of human mobility and also an increasing reliance by state uh, on uh, uh, border control measures. So measure to try to filter, control, uh, stop the flow of people, the mobility of people uh, into state territories. And in particular, not all the people, but particularly some group of people, and especially people coming from the global south, trying to get to the global north. So there is also an issue which has to do with long uh, long-standing histories of global inequalities, colonialism, and the structural uh, structural oppressions uh, in uh, in our I mean in our histories and in our societies. And immigration detention, in particular, is can be defined as the practice of uh, confining uh, non-citizens according to migration-related legislation in order to identify and eventually deport them. So it's uh, the deprivation of liberty of people classified as non-citizens because of their immigration status. And it is, uh, I always uh, um, show this photo, which I think is very significant because it's a photo uh, taken by Jose Palazon, 
uh, a member of the migrant rights group Pro De in Melilla, and is a group of asylum seeking people trying to cross the fences uh, between which separate uh, um, the Morocco from Spain in, uh, in the enclaves of, uh, uh, of Melilla. And, uh, and on one side, there is these people playing golf and you know, people trying to, to cross. And I think it's very indicative and illustrative of the uh, power issues at stake here and the inequalities. So when I started to work on these, I, I started first of all as a member of the feminist NGO in Rome. And so we were uh, entering uh, the women's section of Rome's detention center at that time. And it was the first time I discovered what a detention center was. And then uh, I was so shocked by what I, I witnessed that I decided to start doing research on that. And that is when I met uh, Professor Ornelas and he uh, supported my decision. And, uh, and so we started to work on this. And I started to analyze the, the literature produced on detention to try to understand what other scholars and researchers were saying. And first of all, I realized how scarce was the literature uh, on detention, especially the, uh, based on empirical research. And this, of course, is understandable uh, because it's very difficult to get, get access to these sites as they are very uh, politicized and contested sites. And so state authorities are not happy to let people in. Um, in terms of the medical and psychological scholarship that I found when I started to research on this, I realized that there were a few studies mainly conducted in Australia, because Australia is a country where there are particularly harsh immigration policies and the tension is indefinite. So people, uh, uh, and I, had, I have friends who experience this, unfortunately, but can be detained for years, uh, even children and families are waiting to, to know the, the results of, of their applications. Um, but also in the UK, uh, there were some literature. There was some literature on the in the US context as well. And overall, uh, I mean, this literature had uh, um, was focused on assessing the effects of detention on the mental health of detained people. And uh, overall, this literature uh, was converged in. Uh, identifying that detention adversely affects the mental and physical health of detained people, especially vulnerable groups, um, including children and asylum seekers. A lot of literature focused on asylum seekers. And uh, also that uh, uh, as the length of detention increases, Increase, uh, so do symptoms of anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorders, which persist uh, long after people are released into the community. And also some literature which uh, was uh, uh, looking at the efforts for practitioners working in detention settings and how uh, these working experiences expose them to risk of exhaustion and burnout. So, although this literature was uh, uh, very important, I realized, coming from a background in community psychologies, that there was something which was, um, was missing for me. Um, this something was that the perspective that these studies were major uh, mainly adopting was a, an individual-centered perspective, so focused on uh, the effects, uh, the health effects of detention on individuals, and that somehow the scholarship was underestimating the interdependence and the effects of factor processes and forces operating at various ecological level. And above all was underestimating uh, the role of uh, social justice and uh, power issues in determining the, uh, the well-being and the experiences of people in detention. And so um, adopting uh, Isaac Prilenteski's idea of migrant well-being as the multi-level interacting and value-dependent value phenomenon, which is 
it's very much related to the issue of social justice and how power is distributed in our society. I tried to rethink, to find an alternative perspective to address this issue, this, yeah, this, this, this area and these problems. So in community psychologies, there, there is there's also some research done on this, although it's not a lot of research. And I think this is because, as I said, it's difficult to get access to these institutions, but also because traditionally community psychology has been more focused on uh, community-based intervention and research. Uh, but the literature that the studies that exist, uh, mainly conducted, uh, a lot of studies have been conducted, for instance, by Professor Brinton Likes in the United States, or also from Jana Zlatkova, and they, um, they highlighted the impact of detention and deportation policies on uh, individuals directly affected by these measures, but also uh, for their families and also for migrant communities at large. For instance, they, um, they, they highlighted how uh, the, uh, the threat of deportation created a widespread fear in, my, in migrant communities and so also created barriers for people to assess public services. So people were reluctant to assess healthcare services or even to report crimes because we were scared to be deported. And also affected community-based organizations working with them also in terms of diverting their resources which needed to be used to, um, uh, to address these new problems. And so uh, they could not use uh, to these resources to work on other issues, which were also important. And in particular, there were two statements, uh, which I think are really important, who have been published by community psychology scholars. And one, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, led by uh, uh, by Gina, Professor Langout, and I also participated, which is the statement on the effects of deportation and forced separation on migrants, families, and community. So overall, I think these show uh, the attention, but there is uh, an increasing attention in community psychology around these issues. Sorry. And also deeper, a call for a deeper engagement of community psychologists in this field. So going now to my research, um, as I said, my main goal was to try to contribute from a community psychology ecological perspective to building knowledge about the reality of immigration detention and its multi-level effects. Also, uh, in terms of specific specific objectives, I wanted to develop a justice-focused ecological framework to study this context and social life within them, uh, try to use this framework to understand the life in detention and also the psychosocial experiences of detained people and also practitioners working with them. And finally, to try to use this case study to highlight future avenues for research and transformative action above all. So yeah, I worked, uh, as I said in, uh, in the beginning, in the Italian detention context. And Italy, uh, as you probably all know, is um, an important country in terms of migration, uh, migration flows and dynamics as is considered as an entry gate to Europe. And overall in Italy at the present, there are nine detention centers scattered around the country, but of course there are always centers, new centers opening, uh, other centers closing, mainly thanks to the protests uh, of detained people. And uh, according to the law uh, in force uh, uh, at the present time, detention can be up to 90 days, which is extendable for further 30 days, especially in the case of people who come from countries where, uh, with which Italy has some special bilateral agreements, such as in the case of Tunisia. 
Um, and Ponte Galla in particular is one of the largest uh, uh, detention centers in Italy and is also the only one uh, where women can be confined. Um, it has uh, a prison-like architecture and you can see it from the picture I'm showing as well as from these other pictures that I collected during my fieldwork. Nowadays, the, <clears throat> the men's detention unit is slightly changed because it was uh, uh, it was closed uh, in uh, um, I think 2015 or 16 I can't recall exactly as a consequence of a fire uh, um, put in place by by detainees who were protesting for the inhumane conditions and then it was reopened more recently with uh, uh, enhanced security arrangements and this is the women's detention unit, which nowadays is almost the same in the same conditions. So going to the first goal of my study, which was to develop a justice-focused ecological framework to study migration detention settings, what I did was to try to look at um, psychological literature produced in community psychology. And in particular, I um, adopted the uh, Kelly's ecological uh, analogy. So the four principles that James Kelly uh, um, identified as uh, um, principle to um, uh, principle that explain the operation, the everyday operation of social environment. And so, I mean, many of you who are community psychologists uh, are familiar with these principles, but I know that there are also people here in the audience who are not community psychologists. So just very briefly, uh, these principles are the principle of interdependence, cycling of resources, adaptation and succession. Um, the principle of interdependence basically point uh, at the fact that people and settings are coupled and one influences the other. Um, also that systems consist of a series of, of interdependent components and changes in one component reverberate throughout the system. The sapling of resources principle um, highlights the importance to look at how a social environment works in terms of the management of, uh, of its resources. So uh, this principle tries to explain how resources are defined, created, distributed, used, exchanged, and transformed. The principle of adaptation tries to look at the personal environment fits, so how environments influence and affect people through their demands, structures, constraints, challenges, but also how people try to put in place strategies to cope with, adapt to, and resist um, environments, uh, uh, environmental challenges, and also how we try to change environments in which they live. The principle of succession uh, uh, looks at the temp temporal dimension, so how time frames system and social life within them. And finally, I decided to use another principle, which to me was extremely important, which is the principle of justice. And I relied on uh, the definition and the work of Isaac, Isaac Prilenteski in this area and how he identified justice as the fair and equitable distribution of resources and fair and equitable treatment of people. And of course, he speaks about different types of justice specific to uh, each ecological level. So this was the analytical framework I relied on, taken from community psychology scholarship, and I tried to adapt it to the context of detention. So uh, what I did with also the collaboration of Professor Ornelas and my other co-supervisor, Professor Katerina Archidiakono, was to try to understand how we could use this ecological framework to understand what happens uh, um, inside this context, detention centers, how life uh, work in them. And we identified a number of indicators for each principle and tried to then define 
uh, how this principle could apply to the study of uh, detention context. So very briefly, this is the research design of my study. Um, and, uh, it was a qualitative case studies and I adopted the critique ethnographic framework, so trying to uh, focus, given that uh, the oppressive site where I was conducting my field work, we tried to center power and justice at core dimensions in our analysis. And in terms of method, I, methods, I relied on participant observation, but also topic-focused interviews with detained people and practitioners working with them, and document and multimedia data analysis. And I triangulated these different data sources, uh, trying to then analyze them in light of the justice-oriented ecological framework we developed before. What are the main findings, which I think it's the most important part? So in terms of justice, and I'm going to start with this principle, as, as I said, I think it's the most important dimension at stake in my study. So what overall uh, came out of my research was the, the humanization and the personalization that uh, characterized the treatment of detained people and which was exemplified by the fact that people in detention inside Ponte Galeria, they were called by their num numeric identifier rather than their names. So for instance, as Carl, a detained man I met said, already after a few days here, I feel like a prisoner of this modern concentration camp in all senses. I'm number 8703. Here we are all numbers. In addition to the dilapidated conditions of the facility and the poor living condition inside, issues of information and communication also emerge as being particularly critical inside Ponte Galeria. The majority of detained people had little understanding of what was happening to them and received minimal, patchy, or even intentionally distorted information about the reasons for their detention or the status of their immigration cases. And this situation amplified an overall sense of confusion and uncertainty, which was worsened by detained people's perception of their treatment by police as being arbitrary and uneven, both outside and inside Ponte Galeria. In addition, uh, lawyers who did their work out of a sense of political engagement were too few. So the majority of lawyers were unreliable and failed to help detained people gain clarity or assert their legal rights. So most of them gave minimal attention to detained people's cases and even sometimes took advantage of their vulnerability for their personal financial gains. So as a result, detained people were often left alone to navigate the detention system, and even cases of police brutality or abuse were largely unchallenged. As illegalized and deportable aliens, detained people were ultimately excluded from having access to fundamental rights entitled to citizens, and that ended up not receiving the protections they deserved. Going now to the principle of interdependence, uh, what emerged overall was how uh, the violent detention environment affect uh, both the life of detained people, but also of staff members at multiple level. So um, in terms of Detained people, the majority of them share a significant amount of personal and family related distress. Their suffering was primarily associated with the prison like environment of the center, the hyper regulation of life and poor living conditions, the lack of activity, stimulation, and uh, uh, the rupture with their previous routine. And also with the 
a sense of perceived uh, unfairness uh, of, of this detention as a form of confinement for without having committed any crime. The specific situation was the one experienced by uh, people uh, who had experiences in the prison system, so like former prisoners, who protested the unfairness of being confined for a second time as a, a form of double, double punishment. For instance, Samir, the tenant man I met, said, I was angry. I arrived from one jail to be confined in another jail. So above all, the tenant people uh, viewed the experience of incarceration itself, together with the uncertainty and unpredictability about its duration and possible outcomes, as causing their greatest harm to their mental and physical health. And the tension also affected uh, the family system of those confined, because people were stripped of their family roles and prevented from contributing to their family lives, including financially. And as a consequence, many families were suddenly left without a, st a steady source of income and often had to take on the, the additional financial burden of paying a lawyer. So um, the disruption was also at the level of social networks, as many people were abruptly taken from their communities, and even in the case of deportation, we were prevented from uh, bidding farewell to their friends and acquaintances. Uh, and a sense of powerlessness and frustration overall seeped from the detention center into migrant communities. Going now to the cycling of resources, uh, what emerged here was that all the participants reported that any initial available resources diminished over time and were unfairly distributed. So the outsourcing of Italian detention centers management to private entities, such as social cooperatives, based on the most economical competitive bid, was widely criticized. This outsourcing scheme was ultimately understood as a mechanism to make detention a profitable business for the private sector and a less exp expensive um, obligation for the state at the expense of detained people themselves. So as Lassad uh, put it, you realize that you're that you're in a kind of concentration camp, concentration camp that exists because each life has a price, the one paid to those who keep us inside. Because of progressive reductions in the budget for managing these facilities in Italy, the reduced cost services and resources available to detained people were reduced over time. And so also the regionally poor sanitation worsened and also staff was downsized. And this process was accompanied by an overall increase in distress and tension inside the center. Going now to the principle of adaptation, and of course, um, I mean, there are a lot of other uh, important points that I, I'm, not, I'm not able to, to mention them all today, but I'm trying to highlight the main, the main findings and issues. Um, so to navigate the overtly oppressive and uncertain nature of life in detention, Detained, relies, detained people relied on family and friends outside the center for emotional support, but most of all on their fellow detainees. So relationships which at times became even uh, romantically involved, as in the case of Rami and Masha, were described as a source of emotional, informative, and material support. So most of the time were detained people who, when someone entered the center, provided them with a, a mobile phone to call their lawyers or their family members, and also with information uh, to understand what was happening and contact with lawyers. Not everybody coped with their confinement, however, by relying on social and intimate networks uh, formed within Ponte Galeria. Some people opted for isola isolation in their rooms, while others used legally prescribed or illegal drugs to alienate themselves from the harsh reality of confinement. And a large number of people found the motivation to keep on going through religious and spiritual practices. 
Also, a lot of creative strategies of self-destruction were put in place. So overall, uh, uh, the tainted people regained a sense of control and power by displaying resistance to detention. In fact, a, multi a multitude of forms of individual and collective resistance constituted the essence of Ponte Galeria daily life. The tainted people used riots, protests, fires, individual and group escapes, and physical altercations with detention staff and police officers to challenge the detention and deportation machine. And even some farms at times was used as a form of political agency, for instance, uh, uh, like uh, as a way to, to proclaim the unfairness of a confinement for being born on the wrong side of the planet. Other strategies of this resistance encompassed artistic creation, which included writing, painting, and you can see here some paintings in the women's uh, dormitories or um, singing. And here you can see some Nigerian women singing and celebrating the release of some fellow detainees and also story writing. And all these actions displayed the complex volition of detained people and uh, possessed an immense political potential. Now, finally, going to succession, which is the last principle. Uh, what emerged here was how time in detention is bound up in power relations. So most people inside Ponte Galeria felt the time was pass passing extremely slowly and was characterized by long periods of waiting, occasionally punctuated by detention's routine and bureaucratic timeframes. Time Many people reported feeling stuck without any opportunity of making any progress in their life. As Amina told me, during the daytime, I wait for the night to come, and at night, I wait for the day. I wish the time would pass quickly. I feel suffocated because I think a lot. I don't know what will happen next. So <clears throat> this sense of suspension status, however, was also marked sometimes by abrupt and unpredictable changes, such as deportations or also release without prior warning, and these changes could be highly disruptive, especially in the case of deportation. So, for instance, as Precious recalled, it was violent, because when they first came, I was surprised. They, the police, ambushed us. They picked some girls. They didn't pick me. Two weeks later, they came, and they just told me, you have to go now. So, some conclusive remarks, and then I know I'm running out of time, so I'll just live with some ideas for discussion. So I think overall my research highlights the high costs of detention, especially but not only in terms of human suffering for detained people, but also for practitioners working with them. And this is a very interesting, I think, aspect and dimension which is sometimes overlooked. Also highlighted the arbitrariness and inhumanity characterizing detention sites, which can be described making use of Isaac Prilenteski's words as uh, sites where persisting conditions of injustice are perpetuated, and we, where we witness abandonment, suffering, and abuse, state-sponsored abuse. Yeah. Uncertainty and instability as specific strategies of power and means through which detained people are made hyper-vulnerable. And also the business revolving around detention, which I call in line with other scholars, the detention industrial complex. So all of these point to the need to address structural inequalities when we speak about immigration detention, rather than trying to improve this, uh, this form of confinement, trying to make it more humane, as often models of alternatives to detention suggest. So in terms of implication for transformative action. I think that we really need to uh, work to end immigration detention and all forms of migrant confinement. Immigration detention centers are new forms of total institutions, and there is a, an important history of work uh, in community psychology on the institutionalization. For instance, uh, my professor Jose Ornelas has done a lot of work on that, and we need to look at, at his work and engage in this process again.
It's important to do so with the active participation of people impacted by detention and border violence in transformative change, because solidarity is about doing things with people rather than for people. And what can be the role of community psychology? First of all, there is a need, I believe, for community psychology to adopt a radical rather than a reformist stance, so working towards the dismantlement of these oppressive systems. So we cannot try to make them better. We need to challenge them. We need to work to uh, close them down. Uh, we need also to promote alternative visions, which send a code with rhetoric of migrant criminality, which is strictly associated with large-scale immigration imprisonment. So for instance, reflect critically on the language we use and reject the language language of border violence, so like calling people as illegal, people are not illegal, illegal are the laws which, are, which states implemented to confine them and to exclude them and to sometimes expose them to death. Another point is to engage in critical awareness actions, anti-hegemonic training, providing students and young colleagues tools to work as allies in healing justice. Engaging in research, exposing the violence and structural injustice perpetrated by the detention and border control system. And finally, try to promote community-based alternatives centered on freedom, dignity, and justice. So for instance, the centralized, flexible, individualized systems of reception, which are tailored on migrants' needs, aspirations, and desires, and based on their active engagement in all decision-making process, processes. For instance, there are important experiences and lessons that can be learned from programs such as Housing First, so I think it's crucial to engage in a collaboration between academia, uh, community psychology professional and organizations, people affected by detention and border violence, activists and community at large. We can engage, uh, here are some photos, pictures of actions, which I think initiatives which are not so difficult to, to do and are important, like engaging in education with students, try to make them reflect what can we do to challenge um, uh, border, uh, border violence and to offer to, to share solidarity with people on the move. And also academic discussion in conferences where who are open for everyone, so without any cost, and where we invite people with lived experiences of detention and border control to share their experiences and provide insights on how we can work with them. Finally, as I mentioned abolition, I wanted just to, I mean, to, to leave these reflections. I'm thinking at abolition in community psychology, when we speak about these oppressive institutions, as an epistemological position, as a way of communicating, as speaking about these, uh, these issues and these problems, as the problems not of people who migrate but, and cross borders, but of borders who uh, impinge violence on these people. We need to be conscious of the risk of co-option, especially when we work, we deal with these systems. Uh, reflective, there is a potential for duality. Can we engage uh, mid-term, short and mid-term to, to produce, to improve a condition while maintaining a long-term vision to uh, end uh, this, this form of violence and injustice? And overall thinking about abolition as a process. And here is a conference which will take place this weekend and there is a discussion with that I'm gonna uh, have with also some colleagues who are here, Brad, uh, Moshud, Aminata, Dora, Megan, and we're gonna discuss about these issues. And I think it's an important initiative because uh, it's a conference where psychology want to, and psychologists want to reflect on the intersection of abolition and the colonial psychology and how can we end mass incarceration? Um, yeah, I think I'll stop here. And yeah, thank you. Maybe I took a little bit too long, but 
I hope it was interesting and I'm looking forward to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Your timing was perfect and uh, I share with the audience a great appreciation for, for your work, for your, I would say, also provocative reflections that uh, ask us to take a stance, a very specific one. And I think that this is really, well, something that is part of our um, culture, but in any case, I think it's, it's really uh, important to uh, make this as a clear claim, as a strong request uh, in order to end uh, this kind of uh, oppressive environments. But I cannot take uh, time any longer. I leave the floor to Gina Langhout, who is uh, our other key important guest that will engage in conversation with you and with us. Wonderful. Thank you, Cinza and Frances Fran Francesca for the invitation today. And I'm delighted to join you and be here. And I think um, maybe we can just, uh, before, I, before I begin, I have a lot of before I begin, just take two deep breaths together because what you presented, Francesca, was um, challenging, uh, I think, but, well, for me and for perhaps for others to hear as well. So maybe we can just take two deep breaths together. One. And two. All right, thank you. I want to uh, begin my remarks with a land acknowledgement for where I am right now. So the land I'm on is the traditional and unceded territory of the Yupi tribe of the Owaswas Nation. Today, these lands are represented by the Ama Mutsun Tribal Band, who are the descendants of the Owaswas and Mutsun Nations whose ancestors were taken to Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the central coast of California. Today, the Ama Mutsin are working hard to fulfill their obligation to the creator to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning efforts through the Ama Mutsin Land Trust. And I want to point out that the land that they have been um, on and uh, stewarding is uh, some of the only land that was not burned during our huge fires last year uh, because of the way that they have stewarded that land. So I think that that ancestral knowledge is really important to uh, point to, especially in this moment of, of the, the teetering of global climate change. So I do my best to work in solidarity by questioning how Mission Santa Cruz is represented to the public and pushing for a more accurate representation, working against violence in my own community and learning about and teaching decolonial philosophies. So first I wanna just begin by congratulating Francesca. I think based on your presentation today, it's uh, incredibly clear why you were giving this dissertation award or why you won this dissertation award from um, two different professional societies across the pond from one another. Um, so really, I think that, that your dissertation really speaks to um, in many ways, the best of and of what community psychology has to offer and an interrogation of the directions forward, especially around centering power and inequity. And um, I, I need to, before I go into uh, reflecting directly on your presentation, I can't start without recognizing the harrowing situation that's happening right now in the US at the border in Texas. Uh, where uh, Haitian people who want to make a bid for um, refugee status or being, being um, in, in this position, asylum seekers, are being forced to stay in deplorable conditions and are turned away violently and in mass from attempting to apply for refugee status in the U.S., which is their human right to do. Um, of course, this is a form of anti-Blackness with old roots, the Biden administration is using a policy also used by the Trump administration called Title 42. This specific version of disregard and dehumanization is relatively new given the COVID-19 pandemic, but the trope is old. 
As I recall, Haitian be people being turned away on boats in the early 1990s when they were fleeing for their lives after the overthrow of, of Jean Bertrand Aristide. Then the US turned them away based on racist stereotypes also related to contamination, not at that time from COVID-19, but due to HIV. Of course, there are always ways to address public health concerns with, with possible refugees, such as what is being done with refugees from Afghanistan now and what was done with refugees from Cuba in the 80s and 90s. So I just uh, wanna lift that up and it would be, it would feel very wrong for me to, to go into my reflections um, for your dissertation, Francesca, without mentioning uh, what's happening here and lifting that up. So I really wanna commend you, Francesca, on the, the wonderful conceptual work that you have done together to bring together some community psychology um, foundational ways and paradigms, but also imbuing them with um, power in ways that maybe they haven't always been imbued with or you know, centered. So bringing together this ecological model with Kelly's uh, four principles and then also bringing justice in really helps us to understand and, and really center power in important ways. So I think that what you've done here is you've facilitated a coherent framework and a way to understand detention and the effects on all those implicated in those systems. And I really commend you for not only focusing on people who are being detained, but also people who are working in these facilities to um, start to draw some of these links together because that's a place uh, potentially for solidarity as well. And I think you do an excellent job of showing that in terms of how um, you know, the people who are working in these facilities are also not the ones who are setting the policies and are potentially harmed as well, although of course very differentially um, from these policies. So um, this enables us to implicate how these systems are all part of state violence. And that's really, I think, um, what you do a powerful um, job of showing us. So this moves us out of that individual level of analysis, as you pointed to, and gets us to attend to context. Um, and also what happens, uh, you know, in terms of this context, thinking about what happens even before somebody gets uh, detained as sort of I've drawn attention to with what's happening on the, the US border right now. And to really see this as the continuation of a form of state violence um, that can be uh, stopped as well. So this moves us to systems and um, also into action. And another piece that I think that you did quite well in this presentation and in your dissertation was to not only focus on um, a, a damage-centered narrative, uh, but also through bringing in adaptation, you get us to focus on resistance and um, how another world could be possible. So this then is very much in the tradition of um, Eve Tuck, who is an indigenous scholar in the Americas, um, in North America, uh, and um, who, whose work has been brought into community psychology explicitly with people like Ermitata Ermi Dutta and others um, to think, you know, and part of what Eve Tuck wants us to do is to move out of this idea that we should, that we're going to somehow, you know, quote, write the world by focusing on the, the kind of a litigation framework and the damage that has been done only, um, and that that just continues that individual narrative of, uh, of damaged people. And so instead, we need to also think about desire and desire-based frameworks. And I think that you do that really well, Francesca, in your dissertation and presentation by focusing on resistance and through that showing us how the resistance is always in, in response to uh, an abuse and misuse of power, but then also moving the conversation toward abolition and other ways that we could be organizing our society. And so I think that's a really nice bridge in terms of uh, ways forward in community psychology and other theories that can be brought to bear and maybe also become central to our field, even though they aren't yet. 
And so with that, I want to um, kind of give two examples from a U.S. context that can help move us forward into other, you know, possibilities of resistance and just also other possibilities. Um, one is, oh, and one other thing before I, yeah, okay, I'll do that first. All right. So, um, <laughs> So these two are a lot of small actions that have happened across the US in the past several years, where people who are primarily um, have been either detained or have family members who have been detained, but mostly young people of color who also identify as queer or trans are really leading these movements because at least in the US, these are also the groups who are being um, even doubly and triply harmed through detention um, because they have been put into solitary confinement. Uh, presumably, you know, the, it, the excuse given is that it's for their own protection. Uh, but, and in the US people can be de detained indefinitely because um, people can get put into detention as a civil violation, not a criminal violation. So our laws that would say that you can't be detained for long periods don't apply because that's about a criminal violation and not a civil one. So we end up then with people who are detained for many, many years without any idea of when they might be released. And then if they are queer or trans, they can end up in solitary um, for very long periods of time and we know from um, the UN that anything, any kind of solitary confinement for more than 15 days is considered torture. And so, you know, we have this problem not only in our detention facilities, but also in our, our all of our mass incarceration facilities in this country. So we have groups like um, Black LGBTQ Migrants Project or BLMP, and also Familia Trans Queer Liberation Movement. Uh, both very active in the Southwest of the United States and other places as well, who are raising awareness of how queer and trans people are treated in detention and also advocating for abolition of ICE. Um, and so there are, you know, these groups, that, like I said, there have been movements, local movements, even across the US. Um, with groups such as this blocking intersections to draw attention, um, putting up um, cages so people can see, you know, how people, how others are being, how people in detention facilities are being treated. Another one that I want to lift up that I think is really important is a group that has been labeled perhaps after the infiltrators. And this happened in Florida. This is the Broward Detention Facility, um, which is a private facility. So here in the U.S., we have not only public uh, detention facilities, but also private detention facilities. And these were young dreamers who decided to cross the border and then re-enter the U.S. and get themselves detained. And the reason for doing this is they wanted to be inside the Broward Detention Facility so that they could organize people within that facility. And so the, we know in the U.S. the number one way to get out of detention is access to an immigration lawyer. And um, you have to pay for this because this is not, you know, this is not provided to you because um, crossing the border, border without papers is, or being in the U.S. without papers is a civil offense, not a criminal offense. So you have no right to any um, legal representation. So they got, they got themselves into these facilities to organize inside these facilities to connect people to attorneys. It was an incredibly powerful movement. They were able to release many, many people. They were eventually um, you know, found out and uh, released from the facilities themselves. But at that point in time, they had already done so much organizing that it was pretty unstoppable. Um, and so there's actually been a, a documentary, kind of a docudrama made about this that is definitely worth um, checking out. They also have uh, a segment that's uh, free to listen to on This American Life. It's in the episode called The One Thing You Shouldn't Do. <laughs> um, but, you know, just incredibly brave work being done by young people, many of whom are queer and trans uh, in the U.S., and so I just want to lift that up too in terms of examples of what this resistance looks like, um, what people who are being directly impacted by the, these kinds of state violence, how they are organizing and what this looks like. And so 
uh, I think you, you do a really nice job near the end here of talking about the role of community psychologists and what we can do. And I think really our role is to accompany, um, as you were saying, not to lead, uh, but to simply accompany. Uh, these movements are happening. So how can we lend our skills to these movements that are seeking transformation and liberation? How can we also draw attention to the concept of citizenship? to show that this is something that is socially constructed. Uh, you know, in the US, for example, people when they had been freed after enslavement were not considered citizens. Why is that? You know, how has this category been used to exclude from the beginning? Um, so I wanna add that to, to you know, your list as well. Um, and then with that, I have some Questions. I'm just going to pose all of them to you because maybe you only want to answer one. And, um, and I have a, a few questions for the, um, the audience as well. So the questions, uh, Francisca, again, take up any of these or none of them if you don't want to. Um, I was curious to hear more about what was the most surprising to you regarding what you learned in, in your dissertation research. I was also interested if you could talk more about your own self-care routines through all of this, because this work is challenging to do. And if we as community psychologists want to do this work for the long run, we also need to sustain ourselves, recognizing that we're not the ones um, typically who have experienced the most damage from this, yet there is still trauma from being in these spaces and hearing these stories. Um, I'm curious to hear more about what happens to queer and trans people in detention in Italy. Um, and also if there are immigrant led movements um, to abolish detention, uh, what are they working on? And what are the next steps for you, especially given the focus that you've had in the second half of your presentation around abolition? Um, and for the audience, my questions are, if you've been in a position or had family in a position like what Francesca describes, what would you add to this presentation uh, that you would want community psychologists to know um, in terms of solidarity work moving forward? And if you're a community psychologist, what actions do you see as possible moving forward? So with that, I'll uh, hand it back over to you, Francesca. Well, thank you, Gina. That was really amazing. And I really 100% agree with everything you said. Um, it's very interesting, these uh, experiences of queer resistance, uh, uh, resistance of non-binary people non and trans people uh, against borders. Uh, I think it's really important to look at this. Um, so, and I completely agree also on uh, the attention to citizenship, because I think that is the main point at stake. So I really appreciate that you, you brought this up. Um, and I just add a, a very little remark on this, that many of the people I met in detention, some of the people I met in detention in Rome, they never had an experience of migration. They were born and raised in Italy, but they were deprived of their citizenship rights, so they were not recognized as citizens. And this is very clear, for instance, in the case of Roma communities. Um, many Roma people are born or, or, or raised in Italy, but many of them, due to the marginalization and exclusion they face, they are not entitled to citizenship rights. And so they are punished and confined in these sites, even though often they cannot be deported. So it just becomes a form of punishment, racist punishment. So yeah, thank you for that. I think it's really important. So what was more surprising to me? Uh, was surprising to me uh, once to, to find out that, I mean, I, I guess when I entered there, I had kind of an ideological stance. So I was seeing things more black and white. And of course, I was more empathetic towards detained people. And I was a little bit distrustful uh, towards staff members and especially police. It was very surprising to me to understand that often that, that things are not white and black. And once it happened to me, this, this very strange 
situation in which I was called one day by uh, the, an immigration officer. I mean, they, they told me, look, they want you, the police want to speak with you. So immigration, um, the immigration staff want to speak with you. And I was very scared because I thought, oh, gosh, they, they saw something through the CCTV camera. So maybe, uh, I don't know, they're going to tell me you have to stop your research and whatever. When I went there, I found this man who told me, asked me, oh, so now you're doing this research. Um, I've noticed that you were speaking with that young man, a young Portuguese man, uh, the other day, because there was a Portuguese young man who had found himself detained there. And very, I mean, funnily enough, he was also a psychologist. So he had studied, uh, I mean, he had an experience as a psychologist. And so I started to speak with him. So basically, this man had been deported and this police officer had escorted him. And um, funnily enough, the deportation flight was late, was delayed. And so they remained in the airport and started to chat. And basically, the police officer started to disclose him a lot of uh, struggles he was going through. Like he had, his mother had passed away and he was suffering and he had some serious, serious depression issues, mental health challenges. And he started to speak with Rui, who was the name of, of the detained man, who started to listen to him while they were waiting for the deportation flight. And so when he called me, he told me, look, I would like to know if you have the contact of this man, because he was, he changed my life. I have been in therapy for years, but the therapist never, have never done nothing for me. While speaking with him was amazing, changed my life. And I really want to go and meet him. Uh, I can't speak about this with my colleagues, but he was so like a light in the dark. Uh, yeah, that was very surprising to me because I was not expecting that. And I realized how, yeah, things sometimes are complex and emotional bonds can be forged in very strange place where you never think you could forge emotional bonds. And even though I think issues are structural, I also think it's important to reestablish and promote these bones because part of all this is about the humanizing people and cutting these bonds between us so yeah this is an ad an adduct. and i think yeah i will leave the other issues because i don't want to take too much time but i would like to hear the audience responses about your questions and also and I could invite Giacomo and Emilio who I know are here I hope they are actively listening otherwise they will hate me because they are actively involved in the anti-detention movements in Italy and as Gina was asking what is the situation and how Italian deten anti-detention movements are um, dealing with or embracing uh, abolition and an abolitionist agenda, uh, if you want to tell something about this. Shall I take direct? Okay, yeah. I will try to uh, say something about it, oh, although very complex topic. And thank you very much uh, to Francesca and Gina for your uh, interesting points. Uh, I will stick briefly just to the Italian case uh, to mention that um, uh, the Italian detention centers have been extremely uh, locked like we, we it has become almost impossible to ac access them for any form of civil society organization because of the pandemic so uh, the sanitary border clearly became uh, a huge new layer of uh, deprivation and silence uh, in inside those centers it also and especially because not only activists and NGOs and civil society was prevented from entering, but also because the condition inside uh, became much worse. Um, and in relation to abolitionism, 
I think we, we have several uh, activist movements and civil society movements and organization. Uh, most of the time, I think uh, there are also, you know, individuals that come together because all of a sudden this detention center open in the urban area where nobody would have ever thought of seeing this thing. I think uh, it's interesting, could also be problematic uh, to a certain extent. In Italy, the main, you know, keyword for, for defining a detention center is called them lager. So with reference to uh, uh, concentration camps, which of course gives you an idea of how these individual citizens respond to the fact that a detention center is open to in, 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 the, uh, in the city. Uh, but also I think sometimes, you know, drawing these comparisons, comparison that might not be the best, also because sometimes if there is uh, a sort of strong uh, emotional reaction, uh, which I uh, completely am part of and I agree with, then when it comes to what we can actually do and what it actually means to have a detention center in your city and how we can respond to this, in many cases, there is a part of this movement that is very fragmented and non-coherent, of course, that uh, looks more for reformist approaches to detention centers. So. Uh, we should make them better. We should uh, give them more access to legal and uh, legal support and sanitary uh, support inside the detention center. Um, and yeah, of course, this creates a sort of a fraction with the more radical part, which exists and is quite active. Uh, although, on the other hand, sometimes the more radical part. Uh, takes a very strong stand that is uh, we don't enter in these places uh, because we don't recognize their existence. I mean, it's not that we don't recognize their existence, we want to abolish them. So by entering them, we kind of uh, uh, give themselves, uh, give, give these centers an authority. But of course, you know, here now is, is the dilemma, especially for detention centers and closed institutions. How do you know about what's going on? If you can communicate with people inside and now in italy you don't have like in all detention centers people can't have their their cell phone inside their smartphone of course there are cases of people managing to to have it in but most of the times there are no communications so if people can't enter how can we know about what's going on and therefore create a, an agenda a campaign against against this i don't know if i answer the question but this is broadly speaking the, the situation Uh, I don't know if I can add something. I would like to invite, I know there are also some uh, colleagues and friends, Aminata, who I think is there, and Mushud, and uh, I don't know if they also want to add something. Aminata, she has more experience of the UK context. Um, Mushud, I think, yeah, of the US, but also kind of the African context. So. I don't know if you want to say something. Or maybe they are distracted at the moment. It's possible. <laughs> Yeah, um, okay, sorry. <laughs> well, that's good. Thank you for your contribution today. Um, yeah, in regards to the topic, the role of community psychologists, psychologists in detention center, I mean, being someone that has actually experienced it, has been detained, and um, um, I think there's a lot to be done by. Um, most of these psychologists at the moment, um, there aren't a lot of them in there, but the very few that are in there seems more to be geared towards the system itself rather than actually helping um, the detainees. And 
being in detention, coming out of detention can be, it, it is, a, uh, let me not use the word can be, it is a very, very um, traumatic experience for anybody that um, has experienced it. And when you come out of detention, there's no help whatsoever. So you're in detention, you have no help from the people that you expect to to help you and then you come out of detention you're left on your own with no one to to talk to you so it is a deliberate um a deliberate thing from the government itself trying to control immigration and obviously if community psychologists don't come out and speak out then it just means they can easily get away with what they were doing. Um, I can just give them, um, just to quote it short, I can give an experience of having to deal with um, community psychologists now that I have been granted um, my refugee status, obviously trying to go through the system of housing and other aspects of my life. Within the past few months, I've got like four community psychologists they're already dealing with me. So literally I've got one calling me every single day of the week. So it just means they are there. They have been helpful once you've got your status, but why can't they be helpful at a time when it's even more traumatic? Uh, you're going through an even more traumatic experience. So I think the more I'm not saying they're all very kind of corrupt or into the system in terms of supporting the system placed by the government. But I think if the good ones out there can actually speak out and say, listen, we need to do something about it. And I think more and more would, would come out and say, um, we've got more to do. Yeah, so that's just my own little contribution. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Aminata. Thank you, Dora. I mean, thank you, Francesca, for a beautiful presentation. Um, you know, you 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 eat the nail on the head perfectly well when you said, um, and I think I kind of saved that because I love you so much. You said, uh, need for community psychology to adopt a radical rather than reformist stance. Um, I think that's, that's the, more than anything, I think that's what we need, we need to be doing. Um, my work is, um, refugee strategy of survivor post settlement. So it means I'm looking at everything that refugees are doing, everything that's going to, uh, influence or even affect their well-being after the reset. And I, if I can take from what Aminata said now, uh, it, it almost gets worse when people actually are beginning to be settling down in their post uh, environment. Uh, that's sort of what I'm looking at. But from everything that I've gathered, people are not growing. People are, uh, uh, the environment is not that enabling. You can see on the TV that resettlement institutions in the United States are spending billions and this and that. But when we go into this community and we check everything that is put in place, it's almost like we are dealing with slave era again. Uh, we've seen pictures circulating this week of how someone or the horse was whooping an uh, a Haitian guy. This is sort of what the system is. It's like continuously rebuilding uh, uh, all of this uh, imperialist system that we've been dealing with for. So if I was going to go toward one thing that I really, really picked up on, we need more of a radical uh, stance to change some of this thing because it's not going to change. People are not, it's almost like, um, it's difficult to see it for what it is, except because we are community psychologists and we see things in a system, uh, from system perspective, especially now that um, Francisca is using ecological perspective, it's easy for us to get it from all angles and be able to work uh, uh, the system. So I really appreciate uh, the presentation and you know, hope to continue to um, work along uh, Francisca and others that are doing this work. I don't directly do detention, I do sort of when people are resettled into the system, I monitor their movement, 
you know. And so I see it from a different angle from what uh, Francesca can see, but our work kind of is in line with each other because she's seen it while they're in detention, even before uh, uh, they get they get to come to resettle in this in a, in a, in the global um, in the in, a, in the United States. So, but anyway, in a nutshell, thank you. This is a great presentation, and you know, let's continue to do this work and see where how we can improve it all. Thank you. Any other comment from the audience, questions or reflection? I've had some thoughts about this. Um, I live in Texas, so um, I'm sort of deep into the environment that is supporting um, our governor's actions and that keeps electing Senator Ted Cruz. Um, just to give you an idea of this context. And I think that we do have to take that very radical stance, but we have to be careful in our language because the environment here has used uh, fear to make people in this state, people in this state are terrified of people coming over the border. They've been told that they're here to, you know, rape our women and kill our children and all kinds of crazy stuff. So the fear throughout the state and the, um, which is clearly a state steeped in white supremacist kind of norms. If we aren't careful in our language, they find a way to use it against us to even continue to stoke the fear. So I think that one thing, if, if we're going to create this change and get support from the people we need the support who will quit electing Ted Cruz and Governor Abbott, for example, we have to think about how we can, we have to move quite a ways. And so language is important. And that's the only thing I keep thinking of is we have to find a way to uh, re-message people away from the, the fear mongering and the negative messaging that people have used to create this sort of hostile environment toward, um, and it's not just recent immigrants, it's anybody who has brown or black skin. So um, even people who have lived here for generations are confronted with a lot of this, uh, you know, being told things. Um, my husband is Japanese and black, and he's been called names several times. I mean, he just he tried to help a man going the wrong way down a one way street, and the man yelled at him and called him Hussein Obama. So this is the environment that we're sort of living in. And I think if we're going to be able to make the kind of change that needs to happen, though, we have to think carefully. That's that's all it keeps going through my mind is how we can battle against this sort of brainwashing that's happened here. Thank you, Susan. I think you made a very strong point because uh, we know how, how, pow how powerful narratives are. And I think it's really important to rebuild the narratives where we recognize the humanity because uh, the humanities, because I think it's something that sometimes it's easy to forget because as you said, those narratives are shared across borders and the idea that uh, those people who are coming are dangerous some, somehow. And uh, I have the experience with my students that when they are uh, approaching, they have the, the chance to enter in refugee center. Uh, it, what they discover in most cases is that yes they are being confronted with uh, refugees but they are confronted with young people like them who have the same uh, desires needs willing and probably hope for the future even if they come from very uh, dramatic situation and 
with regard to our students, I see that this makes the difference because they really are able to recognize the similarities, but also the resources and the fact that uh, there is no need to put barriers or to set people aside because uh, there is something that is common and it's it's their humanity, it's their being young people, is their hoping and desiring a future. And I think that this dimension of, of the narrative is probably very important. Also, Fran Francesca emphasized the, the the signs and the acts and probably also the words of resilience and of capacity and of hope and willingness that are very, very important and maybe can help uh, us uh, in an effort. Because I, I do think that it's important to, yes, assume a radical stance because there are things that we cannot ignore. There are things that we cannot uh, um, accept. Uh, but at the same time, we also need uh, somehow to um, build the narrative that helps uh, understand also other people that there are things that, uh, that, that, that some of the fears and the ideas and the barriers that we, we set uh, are based on narratives that can be changed and that uh, we can build a different story. And I think that there is also Donata who wants to add something. Yes, I think the way to develop uh, different stories is to take part in big groups of people of all different things. Like I, tomorrow, you know, the Friday for the Future are doing the first forced COVID big strike. Well, my experience in the last three years going with them and seeing people of all ages, intergenerational, of all kinds of people. Tomorrow, we are meeting also with women. Uh, They're working for Africa for women. We are working with lots of immigrants. And to see, to have, to see that we have common causes begins to the, the work that Susan was talking about and changing the, the way we talk because some people, um, I know that uh, the liberation talk is very important, but we have to understand when we use this language, how they, they are, how the text or the right wing in Italy react. They feel more threatened and they become more dangerous. Last night, I went to see a, a play. By chance, there were a bunch of right with young people there. And I listened for an hour and a half to their commentary after the movie. And it was very, very fascinating for me because they were talking about injustice in Italy in the justice department. We have a famous scandals of uh, you know, people trying to change. Uh, uh, and so, so if you listen to them, like I did listen last night, in a way like a clinical psychologist almost, trying to feel what are their fears because they really felt they, they were mistreated here in Italy by the Democratic and Communist Party. So they, they were the one they put themselves as victims. And so we have to understand that we are distributing the pain if we just don't find bridges. We have to find, community psychology have the big job of building bridges, not taking extreme side because suffering, it's very important to jump the justice and it's very important to vote. But for some of these things, for instance, we have no power to close detention center. We have to go another way to close them. We have to open some, for instance, and fight for experimental. 20 years ago, we did an experiment. We had the, the community Roma, they let us have some uh, refugees talk with students and they made mutual help groups. And that was very fascinating. They helped each other very good. I mean, I didn't have to do much I started and then they work very well and they work for a year together. So we have to think or imagine, how can we build bridges? Because if we just go um, in which we have all the rights and they have all the wrongs, we want, they're very powerful. In America, lots of people still believe in Trump. So, and, and all over the world, we're going, so I'm saying that we should try to go like tomorrow 
in all over the world, wherever you are in your country, there is a strike for climate. And if you can go, you will have a chance to meet all kinds of people and talk to them. And I think community psychology should talk to everybody. And the day after tomorrow, Saturday, is International Women's Day for Afghani women. So I think we should take the big issues that go around the world now, which are climate change, obviously discrimination, and sexism and racism, and try to build bridges, to build places where the people can meet and listen. And then be surprised pleasantly like Francesca was. I really like what you told Francesca because I thought, well, when I go into this place, I have these pleasant surprises. We did a, a program for, for uh, women, young women in Naples. And you know what happened? We were doing this seminar workshop on what they could do for their future. And the, the detention guard asked to come in. They opened the door and stayed and listened. And they said, we want this for us because nobody has ever asked us what we want to do. See, the problem is a lot of the time, the people that are in the detention center or in the prison, the guards may be very harsh males, but they had a harsh life. And sometimes they didn't have anything in school and nobody took care of them either. And so they're even envious because the detainees have at least some psychological support, which they don't have. So I think we should offer, as community psychologists, we should go in prisons and don't let the clinical only go there, but also the community psychology will have a framework like the one that Francesca presented us. But I think we should be you know, radical without using, I really like what Susan said, without using the language of radical, because I saw last night what happened. You know, when these right wing were listened to last night, they began to say, oh, yeah, maybe that one is right. So we have a chance to choose, to change minds if we don't uh, completely take sides. And I think community psychology should not take completely sides on one side because in the world, there is all kinds of problems. You know, for instance, the problem of climate change, certainly the oil men are very guilty, but we are too. When we consume too much water in the house, when we throw it, the things away, and so, Everyone, you know, like should try to change something and, and say to build bridges and coalition with people. That's my approach. I have to go now because I'm a grandmother and my daughter is waiting for me to, to take care of those two children. As you heard my husband was saying, they have to go away at seven. So I have to go and uh, I'm very happy for Francesca and I think it was nice to see everybody. And I don't know if you agree with this, my uh, moderate approach, but I think being 77, I know the other one doesn't really work very well. Thank you, Donata. Thank yeah, you. Everybody. Uh, wise uh, insight and uh, suggestion. I think that uh, even if uh, maybe we are not a grandmother, I think that uh, uh, it's also for us uh, time to close. Uh, the webinar because uh, it's a uh, quarter to seven. And uh, I think it has been very, uh, very interesting. I think uh, that we can um, close uh, this session with some uh, ideas on how we can uh, deal with the challenges that uh, we have been uh, um, discussing on. And I think that probably our let's say main challenge would be to stay uh, on, a, on a, a radical stance, uh, but also try to, uh, let's say, um, use a moderate approach as uh, Donata was saying, probably also because I think uh, we need to consider that uh, our voice and our role can uh, really uh, interact with different uh, stakeholders and different public and probably I think that for some a radical stance is the only well the only voice that we can have but maybe for for other a most a more moderate approach uh, is is uh, 
is appropriate, not in the sense that uh, is, uh, let's say, I think that our, our ideas are, need to be there clearly, but probably uh, the approach has to incorporate and take care of the fears and of the, the narratives that we, that the people share. I think that uh, deconstructing narratives is a, a very strong uh, point uh, and it's uh, a very, it's a huge work. But I think that is something that we can engage with uh, both uh, at the personal level, both uh, as a scholar and both as a researcher. So again, uh, I thank you for being here, for your contribution. And I thank you in particular, uh, Francesca and Gina, because they provided strong, strong input. And I hope that this uh, could really be something that we are we will work on for the for our next uh, future okay and uh, there is a final comment from megan that thanks francesca for the usually work and congrats uh, for the awards and uh, she also agrees that developing social bonds and solidarity between displaced people and receiving community is so important to changing the humanizing narratives. And with this final thought that I think summarize many of the things that uh, have been uh, said this afternoon, I thank you and I wish you a good uh, evening. Thank you.